Welcome to this week's video. I have to say at the outset that for a number of reasons it's <clears throat> only possible this week to bring you the, the Bible reading and the talk, um, various pressures and other things I won't bore you with, but I hope that's at least something to offer you. And having missed our series on Moses and Exodus last week to do a harvest talk. I'm, I'm jumping back to Exodus this week. We've missed them getting over the Red Sea and the Egyptians not making it and we're skipping to a time early on in the Israelites time in the wilderness in Exodus chapter 16 and the first 15 verses. The whole Israelite community set out from Elim and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. In the desert the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat round pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, and in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that you should grumble against us? Moses also said, You will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses told Aaron, Say to the entire Israelite community, Come before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. While Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked towards the desert, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that, <clears throat> that I am the Lord your God. That evening quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert's floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. Thanks be to God for his word. One of the ways in which the Bible shows its ongoing relevance to life is in its depiction of human nature. Take that reading. Here we have a religious community who are moaning and grumbling. Well, whoever would have guessed? Is it really such a jump from thousands of Israelites complaining that life has got hard in the desert after their miraculous deliverance at the Red Sea, to church members today who don't like the music 
or who grumble that they're not being fed spiritually when they're making no effort to feed themselves spiritually, or who forever criticise the children's work all the time, forgetting the things that God has given them, not in deliverance at the Red Sea, but in deliverance at the cross of Christ. It's not such a big leap, is it? Human nature is much the same now as it was over 3,000 years ago. Now, if I were God, I might be polishing my thunderbolts to deal with people like this. Goodness knows, as a minister, when I've had to deal with the moaners and the groaners, there are things I want to do to them because they make my work miserable and dispiriting. Thankfully, the one true God is not looking to me for any lessons in how to deal with religious whingers. Whereas I would like to tell such people to shape up or ship out, he has a transformative approach. We find it in the reading, and there are three things that it involves. Firstly, God replaces grumbling with grace. Whereas if I were Moses, I would feel like telling these people, all right, turn around, return to Egypt, see if it really was as glowing as you say it was, knowing it wasn't, and that they might starve en route. God in his grace, on the other hand, provides them with quail in the evening and the mysterious manna in the morning even though they're not really grumbling against Moses and Aaron, but against him, the Lord of all. And this reminds them of just who it was, who delivered them from Egypt. Now, what do you make of that? God blesses those who have cursed him, and in doing so, reminds them of his salvation. Ultimately, it's grace which will transform people, not vitriol. As I said in my Harvest Festival talk last week, the people who do not give much do not need more judgment, they need more grace. And that principle has a wider application than just a lack of giving. I, I've quoted before on some occasions the Argentinian preacher Ed Silvoso, who is on record as saying, in, a, in the celestial poker game, a hand of blessings always outranks a hand, a hand of curses. Now, why does this have a chance of working? You know, there's something about the undeserved nature of grace that strikes at the very heart of the sense of entitlement that many moaners and groaners have. When you are honest in the face of grace, you realise that you can't go making militant demands all the time. Somewhere in the heart of the grumbler is a person who lives by law, not by grace. And only grace can change a life that has been corroded by the acid of legalism. So, although it goes against the grain, and I certainly count myself in that statement, let us seek to offer grace and blessing to those who moan. Secondly, God replaces greed with sufficiency. When the Lord rains down food from heaven on the camp, the Israelites are told simply to gather enough for that day. And had we read on further in the chapter, we would have discovered that those who, despite that, gathered a lot, simply had what they needed, and those who were only able to gather a little, also ended up with all they needed. You know, another problem with those who take every opportunity to complain is that deep down, they're often living as if life revolves around them. In the last year or two, a story has gone round Christian circles from the American pastor Francis Chan. 
he tells how someone came up to him after a service and said, I didn't enjoy the worship this morning. And Chan replied to this man, well, that doesn't matter. We weren't doing it for you. Yet the more you are me focused, the more you want. And so God gives enough manna. Those who try to be greedy find it doesn't come off for them. And like Francis Chan said, the church cannot afford to orient herself around the pleasing of the members. That's what a club does. But the church is something different. It is a sign and a foretaste of God's kingdom. Our life together is meant to be testimony to the reign of God, not the reign of personal desire. And therefore, our God clashes with our consumer culture, where we are told we are entitled, there's that word again, to more and more stuff because we deserve it. We don't. And so, with the provision of the manna, God makes it clear that, like it or not, we are dependent upon him. And as he provides for our needs, the logical state of mind is not entitlement, but gratitude. It's been brought home quite severely to us in the coronavirus crisis, hasn't it? People who thought they were secure in high-paid jobs have found themselves furloughed and then redundant. Or, you know, what does that mean? It means our me, me, me attitude screens out God from our lives. But, you know, he won't be silenced. We learn a different way of living when we appreciate that God provides for our needs. If we truly want to pray the Lord's Prayer and say, give us this day our daily bread with integrity, we must remember that he will give us enough bread, not a whole bakery. Indeed, if we want to practice petitionary prayer, you know, bringing our own requests to God, over anything, we need to learn that the God who hears and longs to answer our prayers is one who meets our need, not our greed. And in doing so, he shapes us for his kingdom. For as Proverbs 30 verse 8 says, Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches but give me only my daily bread. So, God replaces grumbling with grace. He replaces greed with sufficiency. The third and last thing I want to say is this. He replaces anxiety with trust. You know, almost by definition, Many moaners and groaners are anxious people. They're not happy, but rather than find a healthy way to address their concerns, the anxiety dominates, and the way they choose to tackle their unease manifests itself negatively as a litany of complaint. I don't think it's unreasonable to argue that the Israelites in Exodus 16 were manifesting anxiety rather like that. They are afraid of starving to death in the desert, but instead of bringing their concern to God in a healthy way through Moses and Aaron, they launch into their grumbling. If there's one thing an anxious person needs to learn, it's trust, and with it, the accompanying sense of rest. So that's the point of the Sabbath regulation in the passage, where on the sixth day of the week, the Israelites are to collect twice as much manna and quail as on other days, trusting that what they will gather on that day will last them 
for two days. And that act of trust leads to rest in the observance of the Sabbath. It's not the worship aspect of Sabbath that's in view in this passage, it, which in any case comes four chapters before the Ten Commandments are given. It's the rest aspect of Sabbath. That's what anxious people who are being called to trust need to experience. So God builds that into the way he provides the quail and the manna. Now, there are many things we could say about anxiety, and I'm not saying that all anxious people are moaners and groaners, but I'm saying that many moaners and groaners are anxious people. And of course there's an increased incidence of anxiety and often depression in our society, and again it's gone up during the pandemic. We've seen an increased incidence of alcoholism too, and perhaps that's connected. But you know, one of the flaws that can lead to anxiety, and with it a grumbling attitude, is this. We may be one of those people who feels a need to be in control of everything. And when we discover we can't be, that can panic us. Then maybe we lash out orally at someone in our frustration. After all, if only people did things our way, and if only they did what we wanted them to do or told them to do, then everything would be fine. Wouldn't it? But God wants us to know that we were never likely to be in control of everything in the first place. It's a delusion that a technological society like ours only makes worse. Flick a switch and it happens, we think. Well, you know, right now, here in this house, I could illustrate this problem by an electrical problem we have in our conservatory. There is no way of turning on the lights without also turning on the fan at full speed. You cannot turn the fan on and off independently right now. Turn off the fan and you also lose the lights. Hence, we're not in control and thus much frustration and anxiety with various sources being the object of our blame despite the fact that actually we don't understand the cause of the problem, we haven't solved it yet. Pity the poor circuit steward who has twice sent in an electrician to try and solve it for us. You know, God says, enough of the anxiety that leads to moaning. He says, I have ordered things in this life with the intent that you trust me. And when you trust me, he says to us, rest will follow. Where might each of us need to remember that it's God who is in charge and not us? Can we hand over responsibility to him, trust him, and then finally rest and so be restored? Wouldn't that be better than just being a serial complainer? Ultimately, the gospel is the cure for grumbling. God's grace in Christ dissolves our sense of entitlement and blesses us and makes us a people of blessing. God's promise to provide what we need takes us away from self-centred acquisitiveness and the manner of his provision is designed to teach us trust and rest rather than anxiety isn't life so much better when we are gospel people not grumbling people Well, I hope those thoughts help you, not just on a Sunday, but in your 
life this coming week. As I say, I'm sorry it can only be that reading and the talk this week. But I hope to be back to something a bit more next weekend. So, God bless you all this coming week as you live with him and for him. And, as usual, if you've appreciated the video, please um, put a like below. Leave a comment if there's something specific. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, it would be great if you'd like to do that. And if you do subscribe, please also hit the bell icon and you'll get instant notifications when new videos go live. And finally, if you think somebody else might find this video helpful, I'd always be glad if you want to share it on social media like Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or LinkedIn or, or wherever. So in the meantime, have a good week with God and God willing. I'll see you in a week's time. Bye-bye.